In 2008, Duffy topped the UK singles and album charts. Behind her success lies a management team with a 30-year history and a legendary status in the music business. We're saying the marketplace is a forced creation and has very little to do with the reality of what people might want given the options. Rough Trade began life as a small but hip record shop. From humble beginnings, it grew to drive and define a revolution in independent music. As a bunch of radical idealists and maverick musicians turn the record industry on its head. If you were DIY, Rough Trade were the perfect label for you. Single-handedly, really, Rough Trade gave me back some kind of faith in the music industry because up to then I just thought, it's a bunch of crooks. But at the height of his success, Rough Trade went spectacularly bust. It was a very black time and very hard time, and I feel grateful to still be here today. Really. Rough Trade fought its way back, and after three decades of defiant independence, finally made it to number one. The Rough Trade story began more than 30 years ago. 20th of February, 1976. Then, a few minutes later, the second bomb in a furniture shop gutted the four-story building. Britain was in the grip of an IRA bombing campaign. Labour's gone on spending our earnings and spending our savings. A future Prime Minister was beginning to make her mark on Middle England, regardless of what where punk was yet to run amok and a young Cambridge graduate called Jeff Travis opened a new shop at 202 Kensington Park Road, just off Labrook Grove in West London. I've always bought records all my life and I, you know, I love music. And I was in the States for quite a long time. When I came back to London, I didn't feel like there was anywhere that I wanted to go particularly. So I thought, well, if there's nowhere to go, well, I'll have to start somewhere. After I finished university, I went to visit an old girlfriend in Canada. We hitchhiked together from Chicago to San Francisco, and all along the way, I bought lots of second-hand records from Salvation Army stores, 25 cents, a dollar. And a friend said, what are you going to do with all those records? Why don't you ship them back to London and start a record store? Jeff Travis named his shop Rough Trade, partly after an obscure Canadian band, partly after a trashy novel, and began to offer his friends and customers, like-minded left-wing music lovers such as Steve Montgomery, the chance to work there. It was fun. You could listen to music all day. We had a policy as, if you wanted to hear a record, we'd play it for you. Rough Trade sold obscure and challenging records by bands such as American art rockers Per Ubu. Its music policy and its communal vibe set it apart from conventional commercial record shops and the middle of the road rock music that dominated the music business. I started this shop on the basis that a record shop could be something a lot more than just a place where you bought records as though you were going into a chemist. We were very enamored by the idea of City Lights Bookshop in San Francisco, where you could sit in the basement of the shop and drink coffee and read poetry, and you wouldn't be chucked out. And it was about being in an environment where you could just listen to music. 30 seconds over Tokyo. It wasn't a faceless, mindless organization attempting to exploit the general public from as much money from their pockets as you could get. We were all pretty naive, all pretty innocent, 
but we figured we could change the world. West London's new music store had a clear alternative agenda. And when punk rock exploded in the summer of 76, just a few months after the shop's opening right on the doorstep of local heroes, The Clash, it became a natural headquarters for punk's revolt against mainstream music. Oh, shut your mouth. Oh. When they released The Clash album, it was an incredible number of albums we moved in one day. It was either a thousand or a couple of thousand. And from that moment on, the record companies all wanted to give us accounts because they saw the power that we wielded, although we didn't look at it as power. We just looked at it as, you know, we're making this material accessible. But the shop didn't stop at selling punk records. From mid-1976 on, they carried the first issues of Punk magazine from New York. And Rough Trade was very important in that it started to carry English fanzines, Mark Perry's Sniffing Blue, Sandy Robertson's White Stuff, Tony D's Ripped and Torn, and they carried my fanzine, which is called London's Outrage. Punk's homemade fanzines were the first products of a do-it-yourself attitude that would become key to Rough Trade's identity. But the shop's location, just off Ladbroke Grove, made it more than just a punk rock ghetto. I mean, I knew Ladbroke Grove to a degree because of spending some time at Vivian Goldman's flat at 145A Ladbroke Grove, above the betting shop, next to the chip shop. The area where the first rough trade store is is now full of shishi boutiques and restaurants. Back then, it was rough. It's always been a bohemian area of London. It has its history of the riots. It has its history of its Rachmanite landlords. It obviously has a huge West Indian community, and it's just been a place where it's been cheap to live. And where a place is cheap to live, you find musicians. So that was the right place for us to be, really. I mean, we weren't trying to have an upmarket shop. We just wanted to be somewhere where we felt comfortable. It was full of squats, and it was full of music starting from the hippie era with Hawkwind and the Pink Fairies, and then, of course, with the Caribbean community. The Rastas are all coming to Rough Trade, partly because of its location on the carnival route, so in the very heart of the West Indian community. In keeping with its location, Rough Trade deliberately forged what seemed an unlikely alliance between punk and reggae. I came into Rough Trade as an outsider. You know, to me, punk music was just spitting and vomiting and people were looking funny. How do they say in football terms, I was tapped up. <laughs> I was tapped up. I was working for a company, driving around in my little um, escort van. We're coming down to uh, Lebert Grove Station. It's on the right-hand side. So I went to Rough Trade, sold them some... I can't remember what it was, if it was, um, if it was a Lee Perry album or if it was a, a, a culture album. And next week I went back, they said, can I have 50 of that? The last thing you want to be when you open a shop in the community is to be a tourist. So it was very important that we sold Jamaican music. They kept on saying to me, come and work for us. And I thought, well, no, I don't want to work for punks, you know? And then when I went to work there, it was like, oh, you're in charge of reggae. The bohemian lifestyle and political activism of Labra Grove Reggae's independent record scene and punk's rebellious do-it-yourself attitude gave Rough Trade a unique and alternative spirit. In January 1977, when a record by Manchester punk bank Buzzcocks appeared in the shop, Rough Trade found itself in the right place at the right time to make an impact far beyond that of a neighborhood music store. That was my first encounter with Rough Trade. We pressed a thousand copies of a seven inch called Spiral Scratch. Someone rang up and we have a couple of hundred. What Spiral Scratch did is that it showed that you could make a great record, fund it yourself, put it out on your own label, and you could sell 15,000 copies. Bango. <laughs> 
When Spiral Scratch was released in 1977, the idea of putting out a single without the support of an established record company was incredible. A handful of major record companies controlled most of the power in the music industry. Rough Trade was to become the headquarters of a revolt. Daniel Miller set up Mute Records in 1978. It would become one of the most important and successful independent companies in Britain, selling millions of records by bands like Depeche Mode and Yazoo. It was just one of many independent labels using the Rough Trade distribution network. There'd be Dick O'Dell coming in. He was managing the Slits and the pop group and had Y Records. There was like people coming down like from Postcard Records. <laughs> Tony Wilson would come in at least once a month to talk about Factory because we were manufacturing and distributing their label. Just like people just coming in all the time, you know. Independent labels were beginning to make a significant impact on the major companies' control of the music market. And so it seemed almost inevitable that when a bunch of French punks wandered into the shop in 1978, Rough Trade was prompted to become a record label in its own right. We had been distributing a record by this French group, Metal Urbain. And I was behind the counter and they gave me a cassette and they said, we don't know what to do with it, can you help us in any way? And that was the eureka moment where I thought, well, we could press this up and put it out ourselves. The Rough Trade label was born, and by the end of the year, it had released a dozen singles by an eclectic mix of post-punk artists, who found the label's attitude towards record contracts typically subversive. Fascist! Music industry orthodoxy dictated that record companies offer new artists a cash advance contractually binding them for a number of albums for which they will receive a modest percentage of any sales profit. It was a notoriously exploitative arrangement. Rough Trade had a much simpler deal. Clause one, Rough Trade and dot, 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 agree to make records and sell them until either or both of the parties reasonably disagree with the arrangement. Clause two, we agree that once agreed recording, manufacturing and promotional costs have been deducted, we will share the ensuing profit equally. We knew that if we'd have gone with a major then, it was a lot more complex sort of negotiations. For us it was like, yeah, that makes sense. Costs take taken out 50-50, you know, it's, it's all good. The way in which the music business approaches the problem of dealing with someone that's making music is, I think, delineated by the fact that they're going to make some money out of this. They're pushed into seeing it as a commodity that they have to sell. And I mean, we're very opposed to seeing any of the people that we deal with, any of the music that we sell, simply as a commodity. You know, you could say that really, in business terms, we were very naive. And had we been interested in building an empire, we would have behaved very differently. We would have signed artists to long-term deals. We would have made sure that we had the copyrights, like the copyright. We would have made sure that we had a publishing company. We never did any of those things. And why didn't we do them? It's because we weren't interested in building an empire. We weren't trying to follow the capitalist model of how do you accumulate wealth. You know, we weren't trying to be Virgin Records. Rough Trade's ethic was directly opposed to the conventions of the music industry. Here was a business collective that put principles before profit, run by a bunch of enthusiasts who wore their politics proudly. Politics was very kind of special to us. At a very early stage, it was decided that it was going to be an equal pay, non-management structure. Rough Trade was kind of based on the principles of of a kind of beat culture, kibbutz collective. Everyone was paid the same. We had an environment where there was an equality of the sexes. And you felt like you were participating in culture and the community and you were building something. You weren't really building your future because you were just living in the present. 
for a brief moment in time, we encapsulated everything that was right about the human race. I don't know uh, how many of you out there are actually thinking of joining um, pop groups. And when Rough Trade signed this bunch of Belfast punks in 1978, they became not just an alternative ideological force, but genuine competitors in the commercial music world. We started off, uh, recorded our own first single. I got in touch with Rough Trade and uh, they started to sell copies of that single for us. When it came to the second single, they asked us could they pay the costs and so forth and go into it on a joint venture. At the moment, we're considering just continuing that way because it's on a straight 50-50 partnership. Oh, yeah. 